yes, I, I almost forgot how much I love that music. <laughs> of course, uh, some of the leadership team had doubts about it, you know, but I said, no, no, that's a song for us. <laughs> At least that's the story I tell anyway. Uh, delegates, uh, we gather here back at the uh, Eden Court, the new Eden Court, uh, in great spirits as the, uh, the first majority government. I'll say that again, the first majority government in the Scottish Parliament. <laughs> and if you remember our, our mandate, that uh, mandate was based on the record team and, and vision that we have uh, uh, for Scotland. Uh, I can say that after a, a few months in office, uh, I, I now absolutely do know the name of every new Scottish National Party MSP. <coughs> and uh, as we gather for this uh, annual conference, it's not just Scotland who are watching. Uh, the world is watching more than in any of our previous gatherings. Diplomats from more than 20 countries will be with us in Inverness this week, uh, as well as some 2,000 uh, registered delegates, uh, members, supporters, and others at the uh, conference. So delegates, what we do and say this week is of great importance to our people, to our people of Scotland, but of great importance in a wider scale. And we should start the conference with a vote of thanks. Uh, not a vote of thanks to ourselves. Uh, our first vote of thanks should be for, to the people of Scotland for the faith and the trust that they place in the National Party of Scotland. So with that renewed mandate, with our record membership, the SNP has the momentum, all of the momentum in Scottish politics as we build towards the independence referendum. Uh, a change is coming, friends, and the people of Scotland are eager for progress for this country, something that none of the Unionist parties even acknowledge, certainly nothing they expected, and none of them have allowed for the fact that the people have overtaken them. In terms of what we can do for Scotland, perhaps the, the last couple of days gives us a tale, not so much a tale of two cities, but a tale of two governments. Uh, I've just come from Nick, unrivaled as a fabrication construction site, perhaps in the, the whole of the European continent. I was able <coughs> to announce today the purchase of the, the Nick Yard by the Global Energy Group, a Scottish company, a Highland company, a fast-growing company who announced day day today their plans through oil and gas and through taking part in the marine renewable revolution. They announced today that they expect to have 2,000 people working in NEG by 2014, bringing a renaissance to engineering in the Highlands of Scotland. And today also we had the announcement by Kawasaki Heavy Industries that they intend to test their new tidal energy systems in Scottish waters at the world leading EMEC, the European Marine Energy Centre in Ede in the Orkney Islands. Uh, these are key announcements which point towards the future and the Scottish Government facilitate, participate, support companies from Scotland, companies globally with the ambition to harness and to mobilise these great natural resources of our country. Contrast that with yesterday's announcement on Long Island. Announced incidentally as a throwaway line at Prime Minister's question and then a rushed explanation from the Energy Secretary in a debate about fuel poverty. Long Island, uh, the scheme, the, the plan to see Long Island as the world leading centre for carbon capture and coal technology, world leading planet saving technology. And for the second time in four years, friends, a Westminster government has turned it back on that world leading technology. Just as Labour turned their back on Peter Head in 2007, so the Tories have turned their back on Long Island and Fife in 2011. And we heard last night 
It wasn't the length of the pipeline that was the problem. Technically, the project was in first-class condition. The problem was a funny money offer from the United Kingdom Treasury. It seems that the billion pounds of investment wasn't actually there through contingency and risk factors. There was a withdrawal of £200 million or more of that finance and investment from the consortium, not mentioned by the Prime Minister yesterday. It was all down to finance. So isn't it extraordinary that we have a Treasury in London extraordinarily anxious to take money out of Scotland's natural resources, anxious to take £13 billion of oil and gas revenue this year alone, annually, out of Scotland's natural resources, but won't put one-tenth of that, one-tenth of that, in a once-and-for-all investment to secure the future of the coal industry in Scotland. What a contrast between a Scottish Government investing in the future of our resources and a Westminster Government yet again turning its back on Scotland and the Scottish people. Now we will fight to save the carbon capture technology. We'll fight to mobilise the maximum pressure to see that Peter Ed realises the opportunity that's still there. We know that 100 years of Europe's CO2 could be stored under the North Sea in the Scottish continental shelf. We know the opportunity is there and we'll fight to see that clean carbon technology mobilised for Scotland. But wouldn't it be better, delegates, if instead of having to pressurise and lobby and request Westminster governments that we could act in Scotland's interest and put that remarkable array of energy resources unquestionably at the disposal of the Scottish industry and the Scottish people. But there is another reason, friends, why it's imperative that through independence we gain control of our own natural resources. Oil, gas, which we now know will last for the next 50 years. We know it because the Prime Minister has finally realised it and admitted it. Apparently his geography teacher at Eton had told him it would all be over by 2000. <laughs> There's another advert for Scottish education, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so we know, and it's now accepted, that oil and gas will continue for the next 40 years at least. Oil and gas and hydropower and wave power and wind powder and power and tidal power, all of that array unrivaled and years and years of coal reserves if we're allowed to mobilise them. All of that energy resource of this energy rich country there and available. It is imperative that we gain control of it, but there is one imperative that matters perhaps above all, because it is simply unacceptable to have fuel poverty amid that energy plenty. Simply unacceptable. That perhaps is the difference between ourselves and our political opponents. We want to mobilise the resources of this country to develop the industry, to develop opportunity, to develop entrepreneurship, to have investment domestic and international in these great resources. Of course we do. That investment brings with it the future of jobs and training. It brings forward the future for families in Scotland. But we want to see these resources mobilised for the Scottish people. We believe that the natural resources of the nation, bestowed upon us by the creator of the universe, these natural resources ultimately should be at the disposal of the people of this nation. And that priority, that people priority, is what separates us from our unionist opponents. We meet at this conference with unprecedented support. We meet on a unprecedented high for this party, we meet with our objective of independence nearer than ever before. We meet with the support of a growing number of our fellow citizens. 
But as we meet, remember that this party's fundamental aims, written in our original constitution and stayed faithful to ever since, are certainly independence for Scotland, but also the furtherance of Scottish interests, the furtherance of the interests of the Scottish people. With that twin aim, with the growing support from Scots of all ages, of all backgrounds, of East, West, North and South, like our tremendous collection of members of the Scottish Parliament, then we can, fellow delegates, make this generation of Scots the independence generation. Thank you very much. conference here in Inverness and I'd like you to give a warm welcome to the convener of Highland Council to welcome us officially to Inverness, Councillor Sandy Park. And admitted it. Apparently his geography teacher at Eton had told him it'd all be over by 2000. <laughs> There's another advert for Scottish education, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so we know, and it's now accepted, that oil and gas will continue for the next 40 years, at least. Oil and gas and hydropower and wave power and wind powder and power and tidal power, all of that array unrivaled. And years and years of coal reserves, if we're allowed to mobilise them. All of that energy resource of this energy-rich country, there and available. It is imperative that we gain control of it. But there is one imperative that matters perhaps above all. Because it is simply unacceptable to have fuel poverty amid that energy plenty. Simply unacceptable. Perhaps is the difference between ourselves and our political opponents. We want to mobilise the resources of this country to develop the industry, to develop opportunity, to develop entrepreneurship, to have investment domestic and international in these great resources. Of course we do. That investment brings with it the future of jobs and training. It brings forward the future for families in Scotland. But we want to see these resources mobilised for the Scottish people. We believe that the natural resources of the nation, bestowed upon us by the creator of the universe, these natural resources ultimately should be at the disposal of the people of this nation. And that priority, that people priority, is what separates us from our unionist opponents. We meet at this conference with unprecedented support. We meet on a unprecedented high for this party. We meet with our objective of independence nearer than ever before. We meet with the support of a growing number of our fellow citizens. But as we meet, remember that this party's fundamental aims, written in our original constitution and stayed faithful to ever since, are certainly independence for Scotland, but also the furtherance of Scottish interests, the furtherance of the interests of the Scottish people. With that twin aim, with the growing support from Scots of all ages, of all backgrounds, of East, West, North and South, like our tremendous collection of members of the Scottish Parliament, then we can, fellow delegates, make this generation of Scots the independence generation. Thank you very much. Come on.